This aircraft has it all. Espionage, beautiful dazzling looks, and a dramatic finale. Well, it's French February. Well, I say February, it's going to go a bit longer than that, but like, you know, French February. So, bonjour, c'est mode making ball. <laughs> hey guys, mode making time, and we're back at this time looking at the Luan Dupont 411 or the LN40 series. Now, this is a model from Azio Models, or Azio From, I think they're called, which is Chet Nightmatra. We'll go into the history of the model kits later, obviously, as is part of my video tradition. We're also going to have a look at the history of the aircraft and the aircraft's brief entrance into gaming. After that, of course, we'll look at the model kit's construction and my finished product. For those of you who want to skip to a particular portion, so say if you're really into just the model bit and you're not bothered about the history or whatever, you can just use the timestamps or the chapters that YouTube calls them to skip to your favourite part. This was a really exciting project and it's the second aircraft that I ever airbrushed. Actually, when I was doing this one, I found all the footage that I thought I'd lost for my MS-406. But from the next one onwards, we're going to have a brand new needle, we'll have a brand new nozzle and everything, and it's all going to be so much later. <laughs> also, this is probably the last time I'm going to get these, like, French roundel nails that I got, but... Oh well. <laughs> anyway, we should probably get into l'histoire, the history of the Loire Nouveau 411, the LN40 series. I'm sure those of you who have had any dabbling into World War One aviation in particular already know the name Newport. Newport. However you wish to say it, yeah, you all know that name. They produced a really successful line and I guess left a heritage of successful fighters following World War One. Though I guess Loire, which I'm guessing is how you say it, is probably a manufacturer that less people are more familiar with. They produced some seaplanes and more civilian side of things I could see, though there were a couple of military successes as well, or at least prototypes. Now, following Model 1, like happened in Britain with the Sopwith company, many companies either fell into a state where they were no longer viable by themselves, or they were absorbed into other companies, and, well, the Newport company were no different, being absorbed by the Wav. Obviously, you already know that successfulness would be limited by the fall of France, but eventually they would become part of another company, the Society Nationale de Construction Aeronautique de l'Ouest, SMCAO. There are a lot of companies in France, or I think there are like two, <laughs> is it a lot of two? But there were several companies that ended up forming this sort of conglomerates of smaller aviation manufacturers following World War II. But prior to that, Loire Nouveau did become a very interesting company. So we're going to have a look in this video at the development of the LN40 series. So the original aircraft actually began before they were absorbed in Loire Nouveau and were just part of Nouveau company. This aircraft was developed as a two-seat dive bomber, something that was becoming more prevalent in most of Europe at this time. This particular aircraft was designed for the Marine Nationale, the French Navy. It was more of a family, a lineage of aircraft, more than just a singular aircraft. Although what we're looking at today is the LN411, which we'll go into in a bit why it's called that, this was a series of aircraft. You'll hear different terminology, so the LN40 was the early series, the LN41 and then the LN42. I'll try and make sure you're sort of kept informed which one is which. Just bear in mind that the LN401 and the LN411 are essentially the same aircraft, or at least, you know, part of the same breed, I guess. The LN401 was designed for the French Navy, whereas the LN411 was developed for the Army de Terre, the French Army. The only difference really being the removal of that arrest hook. But how did we get there? It was originally the L140. That was the Newport variant, and this was a really early aircraft. This was when the aircraft was in the LN40 series, and there was one prototype and then seven production aircraft produced. As I showed you, this was initially for the French Navy, before the French Army took an interest in the aircraft and also secured the type. The aircraft did not go off without a hitch. Like many companies developing dive bombers, whether it was in Sweden, Germany, or Britain, uh, there was a lot of hitting the back. Now, this was pretty much just natural development for dive bombers, learning the aerodynamic properties of entering such a steep maneuver and pulling out successfully without either damaging the aircraft or it becoming unrecoverable. The LM140 or 401 was no different. 
and did experience some of these difficulties. One of the distinguishing characteristics of the Luan Paul dive bomber is that it had a three tech setup, so it had the main tail section and two sort of stabilizers. And these were added because when entering the seat dive, it was found to have some serious vibrations that this helped alleviate. Though realistically, from all the research I've seen, it had pretty poor handling. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves. We'll look at its uh, performance in the war later on. So following the merging of the two companies, we say there were variations made to the aircraft. The type was still being produced and developed. And first flew was the LN401, which is the LN41 series, on the 6th of July, 1938. We already noticed that it was closer to the war than some of the fighters that were at the French Air Force. The aircraft would be followed by a second and third aircraft in January and May of 1939. Pretty late, realistically. Originally, the aircraft did have dive brakes, which you'll see on a lot of aircraft of uh, the World War II era, particularly those who were in a strike or dive bombing capacity. However, like other dive bombing aircraft, this was found to be ineffective and they ultimately opted to have reinforced undercarriage that would act as the dive brake. You can also see this on aircraft such as the Breda 65 and also on the Psalm 17. This would be where the undercarriage would sort of swing out from underneath the aircraft and have sort of quite a wide surface area and act as a natural air brake. And because it's undercarriage already, you're not adding the necessary weight, well, not as much a necessary weight, in order to reinforce it against the insane power it's going to have crashing towards the ground. Okay, hold for the words, probably not crashing towards the ground, but you know what I mean, adding at quite a high velocity. Despite all this though, the aircraft remained relatively inefficient. I mean, it wasn't able to carry out a dive at a full fuel load and was also pretty slow. Now, this aircraft had a, a, a dated engine in comparison to aircraft that I've shown before this. This aircraft had the, I always have to check this, Hispano Suiza 12X CRS. And that's opposed to the 12Y that things like the Moran Sony 406 had that we looked at in a previous video. There was an attempt to make a faster version of the aircraft, and it was going to have the same engine as the MS-406. This LN-42 did get to fly in November of 1939, but as you probably already guessed, it was too late. The writing was on the wall for this type. It was underpowered and inefficient against the Germans. The LN-42 could have been great, but it was just too late. Now, on that topic, the Luang Lufour factory also ran all of its records to try and save them falling into German hands. But that didn't stop the Germans accusing one of the developers of stealing signs from the Stuka. May I add, the Mu 140 flew before the Stuka prototype had even been built, so this couldn't have been stolen from the Stuka. If anything, my thoughts think maybe it's the other way around, but there's no evidence whatsoever of that. But I mean, Germany was literally building a secret air force that it was forbidden to have. It's not like they really gave a shit about what was legal or not, is it? So, if anything, it's not that Loire Nouveau is the French Stuka. It should be that the Stuka is the German Loire Nouveau. I guess we need to talk about this in the context of the Battle of France. That we talked in previous videos about how, say, things like the Moran Saulnier was under-equipped to fight the uh, German VF-49s and have less than one-to-one -one kill ratio. This one was significantly worse. This was a single seat ground strike aircraft and unlike its contemporary in Germany or even in Sweden or later Italy with the variant of the BA-65, this didn't have a rear gunner so it was completely defenseless from faster fighters. Add to that that it was just underpowered and generally quite a sluggish aircraft, it was a bit of a sitting duck. Its losses were extremely high. In one raid, there were 20 that went out, 10 came back, and several were unusable, leading to a total loss ratio of 65%. After two months of fighting, two-thirds of the Luangu Paul 401 series were unusable from the two squadrons that had them. That's not just bad, that's devastating. Now, we will discuss in later videos when we look at other French aircraft that French air doctrine was also to blame for the losses in France. France was really stuck in the old doctrine of air war, thinking small arms fire is all that's going to penetrate the aircraft flying above the ground. But that simply wasn't the case. The aircraft faced extremely tough resistance from ground fire and anti-aircraft fire, 
and obviously had fighters that were much faster and deadlier, such as the Bf 109. But I've got to hand it to Luan for the Stuka. I've always said it's fugly. This aircraft is beautiful. I really think this aircraft is stunning to look at. Anyway, that aside, I think it's time for us to look at this aircraft in gaming. Right, guys, gals, and my new pals, this is going to be extremely short. There is always nothing that Zebra features in, and so we're not going to go. We'll start with Flight Sim and Combat Flight Simulator, because, honey, there is no Combat Flight Simulator. I have searched far and wide for wherever this aircraft could appear, and I found two instances. There were a couple of others where there might have been at some point, but I'm not referencing them. I couldn't find any pictures of them or any hard evidence that they definitely don't exist. The Loire Nupor 411 seems to be kind of an unloved aircraft, it seems. <laughs> The first place you can find it, which it doesn't surprise me, is Flight Simulator X. We talk about this almost every single week. This is a really cheap and accessible flight simulator, and you can get it on places like Steam. The Luan de Bois is free for this uh, flight simulator, and it looks fine. <laughs> Much like the aircraft itself, I guess it's a, a victim of its own age, and it, it handles like you would expect any vintage aircraft to fly in a flight simulator. Obviously, I've used some of that footage during the course of my presentation on the history of the Luan de Bois 401 series, and I don't think it looks too bad. I mean, hey, when your options are this limited, you've got to go somewhere, right? <laughs> there is also IL-2 1946. There is also the other game I've most week, which is IL-2 1946. I know, it's an older flight simulator yet again, but these are the only two places I could really find this. It's really interesting seeing it fly in IL-2 1946, because you can put it in combat with, I don't know, some fighter escorts and see if it would have been any more successful. But, realistically, it still faces the same issues that Stuka did. If you really wanted to as well, you could edit some of the files so that it was a bit faster and match the speed that the LN-42 probably would have had, although the LN-42 was a slightly different design. But, we can pretend, right? <laughs> I really wish this would be in more modern flight simulators, and it baffles me that Warthunder has not put this in this game. They put the V-156 in, but not the Luang Lupo 401. Like, Honey, you put the Stuka in this game, put this in. This is literally the French, like, equivalent of B-17, BA-65 and the Stuka, which you put all of them in. Gaijin, put this in the game. <laughs> Please. This would be great for early ground battles. <sighs> I guess that's it for the history of gaming. If you know anywhere else where you can fly this, please let me know. This is never an exhaustive list, and I do try my best to try cover the main places you would see it and where it's still easily available. And with that, it's time for the kit story. Much like the gaming section, this is going to be relatively short. This kit has not had a particularly long life, it's quite short, so I guess let's just get straight into it. So this aircraft was released when I was 96 years old in 1998, so it's pre-millennium, and it's only been released once from what I can see from Azure. Now this is the 411 boxing, and I couldn't see that they've released a 401, which is interesting because this does include the tail look and the Heron Naval, the French Navy Air Force markings. So I'm not really sure if this was meant to have another release, if it was more successful as the LN401. Who knows? But Azure, I really think you should re-release this because this kit current goes like 50 credit one, which is insane. Um I actually got mine from Mort Show like 13, so meh, I was quite lucky. But yeah, it's it's kind of mad pricing at the moment. There is another version of this released by Replica. I could not see anything of this online. The only other thing I could find online were not in one cent second scale. There were also two releases that were in resin, and that was from Checkmaster Resin, which was the LN401. And I could also see a planet models of the LN42, so the LN402, which would have been the uh, development, the one with the Moran uh, Sonnier, is it the 12YS? I, gosh, I can never remember his engine names. But yeah, it would have been with that. Um, I've been tempted to get that because it's still available, but you know, but as usual, you know, we've got a budget, right? <laughs> and for 148 scale, there are a couple of versions I've seen from Special Hobby and, well, Azure. <laughs> I got in LM401 and 411 markings. These are pretty beautiful from what I've seen as the finished products. This is probably the first time I've ever really gone. God, I really want to buy a 148 scale aircraft. So if anyone wants to uh, help do that, 
make sure to sign up as a member or support me over on Kofi to help me get this because if someone literally donates the cost of one of these I will buy it and I will build it almost straight away as my first ever 1.8 still kit I promise but yeah that's pretty much it for model gets it's not very popular it seems like it's a really unknown subject despite the fact it was used more than some other subjects that seem to have more releases it's a bit weird but hey what can I say I'm a sucker for French aviation so I was always gonna build it <laughs> we made it to the halfway point guys Remember to stay hydrated, have a drink of water, or if you're like me, probably a drink of Dr. Pepper or I am brew. <laughs> or maybe some green tea. Whilst you're doing that, make sure to like the video and hit that subscribe button, it really does help a girl out. And hey, if you've enjoyed what you've seen so far and are looking forward to the construction, consider becoming a channel member. Really? It just helps support the channel and supports me making these videos. But either way, I love you guys for watching, so let's get into the unboxing! Ah, so we have Azure, the Luan for LM411 in one seventy second scale. Ugh, this aircraft is gorgeous. The box art's kind of bland, but it really shows the profile so well. Now, inside the box, we get the bag with the sprues in, and the decals, and the vacuum canopy, and then we also get the instructions. Now, the sprues have everything laid out really nicely. You can see here this is the wings and the undercarriage and I think it's pretty nice. I, I like how everything's in a logical place. I like how you can already see how the parts are meant to go together. Honestly, really really nice and the detail is good. You can see the raised surfaces in the bottom and they're just in the light. Everything has the right texture it seems, that fabric -y. World War II texture, it's just so gorgeous on these French aircraft, honestly, I can't tell you enough. And the decals are nice, they seem. I've never used decals from Azure before, um, but you know, you'll see in construction how they hold up, but they're pretty good. The cockpit is a vacuum form canopy, so it's only that top bit of that massive sort of raised surface, and it seems pretty clear. The instructions are they're different to what I'm used to. They're less clear, they're more old school style, but I don't think they're bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's clear enough to see what you do and I didn't find them hard to read. So yeah, they're not bad overall. It looks like a really lovely little kit, I think. Well, now we've seen what's inside the box. Um, this is interesting. I've never built an Azure from kit before. I think sometimes they're just called Azure, but yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I've always viewed these kits as being like really rare and exotic and expensive and I've always been too scared to build them and this is the first time I just went, you know what, I'm not letting <laughs> win because I really need to make these aircraft, you can't just leave them in a box forever and if you do that you'll never really grow as a modeler. A couple of things obviously you saw during that is there's not really any locating pens and it's a bit more in about skill level but we've built a and &E models before right so this isn't really much different. If anything, this is probably easier because it is purely sort of plastic and optional photo etch parts rather than mixed media. And hey, we did our first ever resin video, so I mean, hey, we can do anything, right? <laughs> Let's get into the construction, and as I say, this will have my airbrush featuring. It does have the bent needle and also the probably damaged nozzle. This has been replaced for future videos, but this is the last one with it in. So when you notice that there's some like over spill or whatever you call it where it like splatters out everywhere when I'm spraying it. I know. I mean hey everyone starts somewhere right? <laughs> well construction of this kit starts like any kit that I do with the wings because you always want to let these bad boys dry as much as they can and then well sometimes realize that you've done it in the wrong order and have to redo it. There are these few pieces that I'm painting uh, like two of them that are going on either side of the wing um, you can see there's sort of an exhaust section on either wing um, sort of on the under and upper surfaces and uh, this is just like a black insert that goes inside um, I'm probably sure this probably should be a metal colour but I ended up going for black I just wanted to make it sort of as dark as possible because it's on a small scale I felt like silver might be reflected too much and I might have struggle to weather it properly afterwards so I took the chicken approach really, which is going black. I also um, fitted it how I thought it was meant to be. And this is probably one of the, I think two times where the instructions, because of their simplistic nature, uh, led me sort of down the wrong path. 
but it, it's just that it's really easy to misread it because there was no texture really to it it's just a flat part so i put it in slightly the wrong way you can see me removing sort of the uh the, the part of the molding on here this is just where it comes off the uh, the actual molding press itself so it's nothing to be worried about and it's on the inside of the wing so it doesn't really matter if it's like neat or messy you just need to make sure it's flat so that both sides of the wing can really perfectly align and I found mine went together really nicely to be perfectly honest obviously as a smaller company this doesn't have any of like the uh, guide pins that you'd have on uh, say like an Ethics kit, Ravel, Italeri, Hella, like they always have like the little pin system so you, you put a pin inside uh, like a, a peg hole that's on the other side. These don't have that so you just have to make sure you line them up all perfectly. I always find a good way to do it is just have a finger and your thumb and push them either side uh, like that I've done there and that way you know you're making sure you get two flat edges and then you just go around visually expecting it just to make sure that you know uh, each side is aligned. It can sometimes get a bit tricky, sometimes parts warp. I didn't have that on this kit, I'm just sort of explaining in general for that. Now obviously you can see this is get where the gull of the wing is really taking shape as well. It looks so gorgeous. So once I've done both sides of the wing it's a case of putting it to this main bit which is where it attaches to the fuselage and where the undercarriage is as you can see. Now I loved this. I really enjoyed putting this together. It felt so cool seeing that gull wing take shape and it really is pretty much half the plane done at this point. It's one of the more involved wing sections I've done for quite a while. Even some bigger planes didn't take as much effort as this. Luckily however when it went together it fit. It like ugh it looks so good. I did have to uh, readjust those inside bits as I keep referring to them as a couple of times just because I either squished them out the way or I put them in incorrectly so I ended up just having to go back and readjust them uh, and at one point I did end up taking the wings back off and I'm putting them back on and you'll see that later in the video you know I'm not someone who's going to hide my errors or hide my mistakes or blame the kit for anything and I did try and dry fit things as much as I could but sometimes you just make mistakes and that's okay and that's part of the joy of modelling is learning from your mistakes. You can see here that I put these in slightly incorrectly or I knocked one out, I couldn't quite remember which one it is uh, from when I've edited it but I'm just sliding it back in using some tweezers, it's not too hard to get them in the right place. I've got some glue in there and I'm just angling it in so it looks really nice and well looks more correct. <laughs> now I'm doing the cockpit bit, the cockpit is well, you can make it more complicated with photo etch. I'm going to be really honest with you guys, I didn't bother with photo etch. Um, I did the canopy, uh, not the canopy, the cockpit panel, uh, instrument panel, there we go, third time lucky. And that was pretty much it. Even that I got kind of wrong. At one point my instrument panel ended up falling inside the aircraft and got stuck in the front near where the engine would be and then I had to like use tweezers and lots of shaking it to get it back. So. Yeah, the cockpit on this was incredibly cursed. Again, it's user error, it's my error, it's not the kit at all. The kit was absolutely fine. It was me. I am not someone who loves photo etch. You all know that, you've all watched enough of my videos so now I do not like photo etch. Um, not because it's bad, because I'm bad with it. <laughs> Particularly because super glue and me were not we're not besties. There's a reason I use um, like epoxy, two-part epoxy when I do resin kits because I like having that time to move stuff around. I, I mean, I could do that with photo edge, but then, you know, I don't know. Maybe one day I'll be good with it. But for now, me and photo edge are not best buddies. <laughs> you can see I did get the cockpit done there. So you paint the um, one part of it white and then put the decal on top or the other way around I can't quite remember and that's how you get like the instruments showing through in the end you do not see them I did put this in which is like a, I think a side panel um I think I just painted the inside sort of a singular color in the end anyway and most of it you will never see because it's 170 second scale the canopy is also vacuform which means it doesn't have the same clarity as the standard canopy does it's got like the slight texture to it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, as you can see, I'm just sort of gluing it in. I, did I not even paint the inside? Wow, that's really bad. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm using lots of super glue to get this in. I was stressed at this point, I'm going to be really honest. I remember doing this and I was so incredibly stressed 
because I just could not get that to stick in. In hindsight, I should have sanded the inside of the model so that it was more grip for the glue to adhere to. Um, I just messed it up, I'll be honest with you. And when I put the two halves of the fuselage together, that's when the um, display panel just like flicked inside the model. I did not enjoy doing this cockpit. <laughs> Despite the fact I've just started enjoying doing cockpits, I hated doing this one. I did not enjoy it in the slightest. Uh, yeah, it it wasn't fun, and I'm it's it, again it's my error. The propeller it was really easy. Um, again, it's just two parts. It's the main part and then the little back plug that you put on so that you can spin it and it goes all fancy and lovely. Again, really good quality. All the plastic is a really good quality to be perfectly honest. I have nothing against any of it. And you can see I'm just merging the two parts together here. This <laughs> canopy, uh, not the canopy, the cockpit uh, control panel did disappear. I didn't notice until a bit later on, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I didn't realise why it wouldn't squeeze together fully here. And then when I did squeeze it, I was like, oh, oh it's coming in, it's coming. And then, yeah, I realised that I just uh, flicked the... Uh, instrument panel away and uh, as you can see the uh, the propeller as well yeah it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the smoothest it is my error though it's not as hard as I've made it look I've made this look way harder than it should be now these two little slats are for the exhaust ports as well they go over the well, sort of slight covers and uh, they give it a really lovely shape it sort of obviously forces the air to go out in a certain direction I think I'm putting it on back. No, I'm not. I'm picking it on the right way. Yeah, it scoops in and then it goes out at the back of the top. So we're now putting the um, uh, the wing on and struggling to the right way. There we go. Got it the right way this time. Gluing it all together. It's got that distinctive gold sort of W look. Then popping it onto the actual model. Dropping the model. Always a crucial part of putting it together to drop it. Uh, you can see the wing looks a bit messy because uh, I've just glued it back on, but that's okay. I sort of popped it off and we're just going to glue it back on afterwards anyway. Um, if I remember correctly, I needed a bit of convincing. Then once it's on, it's absolutely fine. Any gaps that we have, we will fix. We will do filler. It's all okay. It's not going to stay looking gappy. Again, shorter run kits tend to be a bit more finicky anyway, and also I'm not the most experienced modeler. The tail section, they don't have, again, like the slots that you would put them into. It's just sort of there's, you can see a raised surface, you just have to align it to. And this tail is obviously more complicated because it's these bits and then the stabilizers that go on the end of this bit. So it's much more complicated than a normal tail section. I mean, I say much more complicated, it's literally one extra part. But getting everything looking straight is a bit of a challenge unless you let everything fully dry. I didn't do that because it's me. I like to build models in a weekend if I can help it or in a day. And I didn't want to wait overnight for it to dry or even wait an hour for it to dry. So I think I ended up just sort of trying to do it all as quickly as I could. It was fine in the end, to be perfectly honest. It wasn't particularly hard. Again, using Tamiya glue with um, like in small doses just meant that everything sort of melded together really nice and easily. I think at this point you can really see the scale of the aircraft and once the stabilizers go on it's iconic i i love this aircraft I and mean, i didn't realize until i built the model how much i really love this aircraft <laughs> like i am a huge fan girl of this now look at that like triple tail it just looks gorgeous now we've managed to get everything on there looking pretty swish we've done a pretty good job i'd say it doesn't look the neatest you can see the uh <laughs> inside of the cockpit is a mess we're just going to ignore that we're just going to accept that that's going to be a mess and we're just going to live with that and that's okay everyone makes mistakes not every model is perfect vacuum canopies are something i used to be terrified of at this point they're just another day i don't mind them so much now i get my little pair of uh, like sewing scissors and i just really slowly cut them out i always find it's really important to cut the big bits off first into a massive chunks off that are nowhere near it and then just really slowly get closer and closer until you're happy with the shape and then keep fitting it and then go back and fit it and go back and sometimes you'll nail it first time sometimes you won't. I couldn't really work out where this was exactly meant to fit because there's not a really really clear guide 
but in the end I found where I think it was meant to be, like judging from photos in the box and yeah, I was quite happy with it to be honest. It looks pretty nice. It's a unique shape for a canopy too. The undercarriage is quite simple. It's these sort of long, I'm going to say forks and the wheel goes into it and then you pop them in here and then the sort of the air brake section as we talked about in the history bit which is the cover for the undercarriage when it's up um, that bit you sort of have to angle um, th that took me a little bit more work I'll be honest with you and there is a little bit you have to sort of wedge in there I don't think I got really good footage of it or I might have done it off camera because I don't remember seeing it when I was editing it down uh, but yeah it, it's a bit finicky it's not like the easiest bit to do particularly because the undercarriage is quite fragile it, just by its very nature obviously but once you get it, it looks really, really good. It looks really nice. It gives a really unique profile to this. So honestly, I, I love it. I love this aircraft. It looks so lovely. Oh, yeah, it's just so gorgeous. So you just sort of fit it on there. You can see I've done it at the angle anyway. I think I put the other bit in afterwards, actually, if I'm really honest. And interestingly, as I sort of said in the unboxing, you can see on the left there, the arrestor hook on, on the table. You can just see it there. <laughs> it's uh, it's just the only part left on the screws at the end. It's really, really bizarre. So there was a really nasty seam on the middle of the aircraft, on the top and on the bottom. So there was just a slight overhang between them. Now, the aircraft in its nature is quite boxy, so I went quite aggressive with this. I just went in straight with my craft knife and I was just feeling the edge of it. It's hard to explain how you do it. You just sort of do it. You just try and hold it at like the right angle to try and get everything flat. And you can see once I've sprayed it with um, sort of Tamiya primer, it's, it just looks normal. Now I'm using Life Colors Army de l'Air set, the French Air Force set that they do. And I'm spraying this with a grey. You, know, you can see it, I think, slightly there more in the light. It is a slightly different grey to the primer grey. Um, I had overmixed it slightly, uh, so it was a bit thinner than it should have been. So I ended up going over with a couple more thin coats and it was fine in the end. You can see that it's separated on the, on the top wing there just because I had sort of over thinned it, but it was fine in the end. I just went back over it and yeah, it was all fine. Yeah, again, I'm learning airbrushing. It's not something that comes very naturally to me. It's a very hard skill for me to learn because I've done brush painting for so long. <laughs> Even on YouTube, I've done them for so long. But yeah, you can see it's all dried there. It looks quite good. I've tried to keep quite a thin coat. And then I went in with the brown and yeah, I really went in too heavy. Now, I'm just gonna to explain to you half the reason for this is the bent needle and the damaged nozzle. The other half of the reason is because learning to use that two-stage trigger with the airflow and controlling the paint flow, I found that really hard. Now, I have since sort of, I've not mastered it, but I'm definitely getting there. And you'll see it on a model I end up doing in the future how much better I've got and it's one that I've done during the course of French month so you'll see it in a couple of weeks time I, I come leaps and bounds because doing this model was a challenge I was really disheartened because I thought I'm gonna really nail this I'm gonna be so proud of myself and I didn't I really didn't like look how much splatter there is there and I knew there was something wrong and that after I ended up doing this model I just took the whole airbrush apart and went right yeah, I can see this is broken, this is damaged. I soaked the nozzle and I noticed there were some bits missing as well, which I don't know when that happened. Must have been when I sort of moved, because I moved in quite a hurry. Maybe I just sort of didn't reassemble it properly because I was in a panic. I don't know. But either way, <laughs> there were lots of things wrong with it that are now resolved. However, I didn't get the worst result in the world. It just, it's a bit messy. And I think up close, yeah, it probably looks worse than it is. Once it has the varnish on though, and once you see it in its proper setting and it's been tidied up a little bit because I did go over and tidy it up a little bit, it looks really nice. And I think, or I hope that you guys will be really proud of it as well because it's another step in the right direction for me. It's a rare aircraft. I may or may not have a second one because I will be redoing it in the future with a camouflage that is more like the CR714. That may or may not be the video where I uh, sort of nailed mastering the airbrush control. You'll have to stay tuned for that. Make sure you subscribe. But uh, yeah, I've got another one of these today because 
I was disappointed with this, I'll be honest. But again, it's because of me. Um, I should I should have left this for later on in the airbrushing, but I just had that passion and drive. And you know, sometimes you just got to do it because if you don't, you'll just regret it. So the decals themselves are really nice. You can see that I missed um, recording, applying some of them, but these went on with absolute ease. There was no worry about sort of ripping them or tearing them. There was no concern at all about damaging them. They were the easiest decals I think I've ever put on outside of cartograph. So, you know, that really speaks volumes. I'm painting the canopy now, and I was terrified of this, because again, it's vacuum form. I think you get two from what I remember. So, you know, if I did mess it up, it wouldn't have been the end of the world. I did, however, use the thinnest brush I had, which is Ravel's sort of smallest. I can't remember what they named the range, like the professional paintbrush range they have. Painter, I think it is. Um, but yeah, I used the thinnest one I had and I conditioned it and made sure it was like as straight as possible and I did okay. I really did okay and in some cases I'm using the very end of the brush, in some cases I'm using sort of an edging technique, but ultimately I think I did okay. I think I got the lines looking okay. The cockpit is so angled and bizarre and unique. It, it's definitely not a cockpit you're going to see every day. It's definitely not one I've seen very often at all. So, yeah, just look at that. Look, you look at those distinct shapes. It's almost like a teardrop, an angled jewel teardrop. It's very, very weird. I painted the undercarriage parts. That's only the first coat. They had a second coat, but they were done in sort of a, a wooden brown color. Didn't want to get completely consistent coloring on there. I wanted it to be a bit sort of unique and special. And obviously there's a varnish on it at the moment, a gloss varnish, which I'll go over later to remove some of that sheen. Now I'm just going over with some uh, humble enamel uh, washes. This is just a black one. I've obviously done it where the exhaust is there. I'm doing it on some of the panel lines that I think need accentuating, just making it a bit more clear. And I don't have white spirit, so I end up just not leaving them probably as long as you should, wiping them off. There's not the stage that probably should be in some places, but I think, I think I get away with it, but you'll see. Okay, but like, honestly, it went better than I expected it to. I am really pleased with how I managed to get the model together. I think I did a really good job. And the finished look, once I sort of, you know, had made sure everything was fully varnished, it all has like a satin coat over the top of it. And with the little bits of weathering I've done, it doesn't look, you know, like it's particularly watered. I probably should have done like some chipping on it or something. I don't know, I'm, I'm still learning how to wear the really as well. Maybe some pre-shading would have helped. I probably went a bit heavy with my colour coats over the top, but it is what it is at this point. I'm really happy with how it looks though. So let's have a look at this aircraft. Popping off. What do you think? 
I know, it's, it's actually kind of impressive, right? It looks pretty good. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this kit. It was an absolute blast. And I think because I was so passionate about it, I stopped being overtaken by... Yeah. It has also given me a lot more confidence to build other aircraft that I'm a massive fan of. Particularly things like the VA-65, which I do have to do, and the AK-3 as well, which I think one of you mentioned in my MS-406 video. So, no, it's definitely ha it will happen. <laughs> I guess we really need to look at this in context though. So would you buy or fly away from this kit? So this is an interesting point and it goes back to what a lot of model kits are about. Is this worth you paying the extortionate amount that collectors want you to pay for this kit? Now, like I say, I was really lucky. Uh, it was actually at the Stoke Trent Model Show. I saw this kit, I had no idea what it was worth, but I knew I wanted to build it. And I just went, holy hell, I have to buy this. It was on the table, I think, for like 13 quid. And I said, I literally have a 10 pound note because I don't, I don't carry cash like who does these days. But I was like, I have a tenner. I'm really sorry. I literally only have a tenner. I, I was like, I have no money. And they were just like, yeah, that's fine. I'll take it for a tenner. I think it was 13 quid. I boy, whenever it was. And I remember getting it first, like, they last because I didn't have all the cash for it. And they were just like, no, that's fine. So anyway, I was really thrilled with getting that. It was only when I've actually built it and then looked after this video because I always try and have a look at, you know, what the market selling rates for them is, that I saw how expensive these are. Now, I've looked on a couple of sources and from what I can see on modeling trading sites and other auctioning sites and other ways you can sell model kits these days, it sells between the lowest I ever saw was 40, the highest I saw was 90. And the average seems to be between sort of the 50 to 70 euro mark. Most of them were in the euros, um, a couple in pounds, but yeah, that seems to be the case. I'd expect this more for resin kits, and I'm happy to pay for resin kits, because resin kits tend to be extremely short run. They require a lot of work for someone to make. Um, and you're paying for like, you know, a, a small business normally. You know, you're going to get those higher prices. But for this, 70 quid. Jesus, that's a lot of money. For me, buying it at 13 pounds, absolute steal. And I knew nothing about the value of it, but I was hooked and I would happily pay probably up to 30 pounds for it again. I don't think it's worth more than that. And I can't honestly say buy the kit if you're paying more than that. So I'm gonna say this in a really lazy way. But if Azure were to ever re-release this kit as either the 411 or the 401, or realistically both because they have the parts for both, then buy this kit because it's an amazing subject. It's really cool. There are lots of hate schemes I've seen for this. So I did mine in like a bigger camo scheme. There are ones with more like the 714 style. There are some with more like the uh, D520 style. Some with more like a bomber style like the one I've done. And and I guess like you could do some in free French style colours and there were some in Vichy colours as well you could do there's loads you could do with the aircraft but £70 to fly away like no honey yes it's not worth it god it actually really hurts to say that because I am in love with like the Lumar Newport later the SM C80 whatever like I love their design language I love the sort of 30s, 40s coming of age look at them. I love the three tails action of them. Oh, they're just gorgeous aircraft. But yeah, uh, I'm rant ranting again. I could talk about this all day. That's not it for me though. Thank you so much for being here because otherwise I'll just talk all day about the Loire Midball and French designs. But yeah, I really enjoyed you being here. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video and the construction of my model kit and the end result. If you've enjoyed it, make sure to like this video, and if you've really enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. I release new videos each Monday, and I'm also doing some other stuff at the moment as well, like War Thunder videos, but like cinematics, so yeah, I'm really enjoying all this. <laughs> if you'd like to support the channel, there's no pressure whatsoever, but it really does help me buying new equipment and model kits and try new things. So become a channel member. You can do it for like $1.99. And if you want to shout out each video, that's like the next year, which is like $4.99. I've tried to keep it as like reasonably cost as possible and make it worthwhile for everyone. 
If you'd like to do it outside of the YouTube platform, I am on Ko-fi, where you can donate to me as a one-off donation, or you can also do it as a monthly donation through Ko-fi as well. It's entirely up to you. Again, thank you so much for being here, guys. It really does mean the world to me. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye! A big thank you to my channel members who help make these videos possible. A shout out goes to the Advanced Kit subscribers, which are Crazy Launcher and Explosive Water. But obviously, regardless whatever level you're on, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here today, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And there's a recommended video for you on the right. I do upload new videos every Monday. Have fun modeling.